Please join me in welcoming uh, my friend Rana Furahar, who's written an extraordinary book about the financialization of the economy, uh, in conversation with the president of Aetna, Karen Lynch. Welcome to Shift Forum. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks to everybody for being here. And thank you, Karen, for coming all this way uh, in the middle of all kinds of deal making and interesting things that are going on in that and that we're going to talk about. Um, Karen runs about 95% of the business, That's so uh, you're, you're, you are a busy woman. Um, and one of the reasons you're here, actually, and, and one of the reasons that John and I have been talking about Aetna for a couple years now as a great company to, to have at this forum is a conversation that I actually had with your CEO, Mark Bertolini, a couple of years ago. I was working on my book, Makers and Takers, which was looking at the pressure that companies face from Wall Street, face from the financial system, and how they can make better choices, longer term choices, really support the economic ecosystem. And he made an interesting observation. He said that um, a lot of CEOs, because of pressure from the street, think about marshalling cash, but they don't think about human talent as something that should be an asset rather than a liability on the balance sheet. And he started looking into that at Aetna, um, found that some of your frontline people needed a pay hike, raised them to $15 an hour at a time when not too many people were doing that. So how's that going for you? Where, where are you with that? You no, know, it's really, it was a really important initiative for us. And you're seeing a lot of companies do it now with the effective tax reform. Um, but we felt like when Mark went and talked to the front lines, what he found was that some of our employees were on Medicaid and they were distracted. And so we did a couple things beyond the $16 an hour wage hike. We actually changed the way we approached benefits. Mm. And what we did was we offered um, at certain income levels um, a richer benefit for a lower cost. Mm. And we also, um, for certain level um, employees, we offered 100% education reimbursement. And so how's it going for us? Um, we have seen a 15% increase in overall productivity. We have seen an increase of um, employee engagement. And so, you know, generally speaking, um, it's been successful for us. But we don't look at that social compact just on wages and benefits. We actually extend that social compact to how we interact mm -hmm. with our members. And what we've done is we've extended our service uh, frontline leaders to have more decision making when they're on the front lines. Yeah. And we've also extended that to the communities. Yeah. And what we've seen is a lift in you know, employee engagement and that social compact because what we're making a difference in the communities. So for example, um, what we've done is we've really put a hard um, line in how we're um, working nationally on the opioid crisis. Mm. And we've also um, been investing in um, what we call our Healthy Cities Challenge where we're taking um, you know, funds and improving safety, improving, and we're doing it here in actually San Francisco where um, we have bicycles and bike safety for kids. And what we're seeing is that social compact when we extend it into the community in addition to sort of the wage and growth, we've seen a, you know, a lift in just employee satisfaction engagement and it's been quite successful. It's interesting because, I mean, what you're talking about is is an ecosystem approach rather than, say, just a shareholder value approach. Exactly. And that is a, that's a big conversation right now. Um, Larry Fink, um, head of BlackRock, largest asset manager in the com uh, country, came out famously a few weeks back and said, every company needs to be a purpose-driven company. But it's interesting, as I go around in my job and I talk to CEOs, everybody says, that's great, we agree, but what are the metrics now? So how do you find, as you're thinking about all the different things that you're doing, and we're going to get to the CBS um, merger in, in a minute, which I know is part of this, but as you're thinking about the decision making, how do you think now, I mean, shareholder value, it may not have been correct, but it was easy. <laughs> you know, all you have to do is boost the share price quarter on quarter, that's easy. How do you think now? What's the metric and how do you um, make that uh, come to life in the real world? Yeah, so I think, it, I, you know, the metric um, piece is, you know, sort of elusive at this point. We really need to think um, more broadly about what that metric is. But I think there's more of what companies, and you know, the purpose driven is not just what the company stands for, but it's also about that corporate social responsibility. Mm. And you saw it today, you, you heard John talk about what Dix is doing. And I think mm -mm. that companies have an opportunity now to take a leadership role 
in the communities and making a difference in how we're showing up to support the, you know, the sort of, in our, in our world, sort of support the health in, in the communities and support um, like that holistic approach. And you're seeing companies do it all the time. You saw Chobani, for example, mm. take a big stand on immigration. You, you know, so you, you know, and I think it's important for all of us to have that social comp uh, mm. com compass mm. because I think you'll get better shareholder value because, of, because you are making a difference and because you're purposeful and because you're standing for something. And you know, what we're seeing is people want to, the millennials want to engage with companies mm. that have that social purpose. Mm. And, 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 and millennials want to work for companies that have that social conscience. That's interesting. So it's about, and that gets to the point about how, you know, we're in a world that's awash in capital right now. That's right. But human talent is what's really important, and particularly talent that can be as flexible and adaptable as you need to be in this environment. And to that point, let me ask you, I mean, one of the reasons that you, that you couldn't come last year is that you were in the middle of a, a deal, potential deal with Humana, which didn't go through. You're now in the middle of another deal with CVS, fingers crossed, yes, um, yeah. is, which is looking more likely. Talk a little bit about these deals and what they say about where the healthcare industry is right now. Why is there all this consolidation happening? Well, I think you have to think about where healthcare, healthcare is 18% of the GDP right now, and it's expected to grow to 25% of the GDP by 2025. Mm. And I th if you think about healthcare, it's ripe for um, to be revolutionized. Mm. And you're seeing every single other industry, you know, um, having consumers demanding a difference. And the healthcare industry is no different. Consumers are demanding something different. They're demanding affordability. Mm. They're demanding access. They're demanding transparency. And as you think about the healthcare industry, everybody's trying to go after those pieces. Mm. And you, you know, you saw the Amazon, of course. Um, you know, Berkshire Hathaway. And I think everyone believes there needs to be fundamental change in healthcare. But you said an interesting word, it's an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And it can't just be one, it can't just be the insurers. It has to be the consumer. It has to be the pharmaceutical companies. It has to be the payers. It has to be the providers. Mm -hmm. We all have to share in that ecosystem to make a big difference. Mm -hmm. And I think when you think about what CVS and what Aetna can do, that is a big change. Mm. And that can revolutionize the industry because one of the things that we've been really pushing for as a company is to move from a payer to a partner, from moving from distant mm. to local, mm. to moving from only worrying about chronic illness to worrying about holistic health. Mm. And, and we've really made a conscious effort to say we need to move from the exam table to the kitchen table. Mm. And CVS gives us that sort of different ability to be in the communities. Mm. And if you think about your health, 60% of your health is driven by your zip code and not your genetic code. That's interesting. Tease that out for me. So it's really about what community you're living in. It's really about our, your nutrition. It's about safety. It's about isolation. And those are all dry. If you're not eating right, you're not going to be healthy. If you can't get out of your house and get, get you know, you can suffer depression. If you're not, you know, in a safe community, you're not, you know, you're not, mm -hmm. you know, secure. All of that has a dries up blood pressure, for example. All of those things have an impact on your overall health. Interesting. So if you think about what CVS can do for us, it's really a new front door to the healthcare system. Yeah. And it's, a, it's another access point. That's interesting. So what, let's talk a little bit about what, what part, since we're at Nuco Shift, what, what part technology will play in all that. And I want to definitely get your thoughts on Bezos, Buffett, uh, and Jamie Dimon coming, God, talk about the triumvirate of, uh, of business leaders coming together to say, hey, we want to transform big tech, and you can kind or sorry, uh, we want to transform uh, the healthcare system. Um, you can imagine just Amazon alone, what, what could be done with data and technology, but there are also risks. I mean, this is healthcare, and I had actually, I was in Washington recently, I had a policymaker say to me, I think if there's going to be an Exxon Valdez moment around tech and data, it's going to be in the healthcare yeah. area because this is the most sensitive in people's medical records and what's being That's done. Exactly right. So, so technology, I, you know, I, I think 
you know, obviously they're um, coming together as an indication that they're pushing um, for change. And, and my belief is if they can bring us technology or something different um, to change the landscape of healthcare, I'm all for it. Mm. Uh, I think that data and analytics will be, or and artificial intelligence will be the sort of watershed of what we can do in healthcare. Mm. Um, if you think about today, you know, we are building, um, every other industry has changed because of technology. Think about Uber. You know, you think about um, the technology and the banking system and how the finances are changing. We haven't seen that um, technology advancement yet in healthcare, and it's necessary and it's needed. Mm. And I think that, and just think about all the information we have that's available to help you. And as I think about the CV, so I'll share with you sort of how I think about CVS and how we reimagine CVS and how technology might play a factor in that. So if you, first of all, you have to spell sort of when you walk into a CVS store today, you know, you see all these things and you probably wonder to yourself, how is that gonna be a health place? And I think you have to step back and think about the pharmacy will still be in the back of the store. Yeah. We'll be able to bring the, and, and we'll have data about you. Yeah. We'll have, we'll ha and you'll Which have. Which will be collected how? How will that? Be, because it's, a, through, we'll get it through claims. Yeah. We'll get it through interactions that you have with these things. Yeah. Um, we'll see it through um, your enrollment activities. We'll see it through how you're navigating the health system. So think about CVS pharmacy in the back of the store. The, pharmacy can, the pharmacist can work to the top of their license. Adherence is a major driver in why people aren't improving their overall health. They're not adhering to their um, medication. Yeah. So they'll be able to have those conversations. You can also imagine what a minute clinic might evolve to, mm. where you might be able to now have um, blood, more blood pressure. You might be able to have lab tests. You might have a, a nurse concierge in a CVS. So that nurse concierge can, you know, think about open source um, healthcare, yeah. and that that nurse can help you navigate um, the healthcare system, not just in the CVS, but maybe out in the community. So, for example, you know, with Medicare, you know, as, as you age, you know, we might be able to have a conversation when you're in the store with us to talk about what's going on in your life. Yeah. And you know, you're not going to answer that on the phone, right? But someone in the community you might have that conversation with them. You know, it's interesting because what you're sketching actually sounds a lot to me like what I experienced when I lived in the UK for 10 years where you do have much more, in a, in a nationalized health system, you have much more of a preventative approach. Mm -hmm. You have community clinics where people are coming in and there's, there's um, a lot that can be done in one place relatively cheaply. You're not seeing a specialist. You're not going to the ER. You've got nurses. But of course, that's a state system. The data is held by the state. In many ways, what I hear you talking about and other practitioners, other companies talking about is kind of developing some of that more sensible, more practical, more cost-effective healthcare, but in the context of a private company. And yet that leaves you with a lot of responsibility um, for privacy, for data, for the regulations around this might be changing. How are you guys thinking about all that? You know, I think you know, one of the most important things that we think about every day is you know, cybersecurity and protecting the data mm -hmm. of our individuals and our members. And we, we invest um, significant uh, capital to mm -hmm. make sure that we are you know, securing. And, you know, and that's, I think, relevant and it's important. And you know, that's a place where we're focused on because you, your per, you, know, you and I have di different personal health ambitions. Mm. And we want to make sure we're protecting my health ambitions versus your health ambitions. Mm. And I think it's something that's front and center and we all need to pay attention to. Mm. Um, let's talk a minute about AI. I had a really fascinating conversation, actually, when I was at the World Economic Forum in Davos this past January with an investor who had just invested in a Chinese company that was um, putting sensors in medical devices. And, you know, of course, there's no, no, no data privacy issues in China, so I don't know uh, what, uh, you know, what limitations are there. But it was fascinating. Yeah. I mean, it opens up an entirely new arena 
um, for, for health care. Where, where are you guys on this? Where do you think this is going to go in uh, the U.S. in the next five years? I, I think you're going to see a lot more data in the home. If you think about where things are shifting, they're shifting you know, into the home. More care will be in the home. Yeah. What we've recently seen, which is fascinating, um, diabetics, you know, every day have to you know, pr you know, prick their um, finger to do their, um, their blood test. What we've now seen, which is fascinating, is they can put um, something on their arm and they can just wave their phone across it and it tells wow. them um, what they need to know. And I think that that will change the way we get information. It really drives our you know, thinking around where healthcare is shifting to in the home and using technology and data to change how everyone's approaching their health in a very mm. different way. Mm. And I, I think you'll see a lot more advances around that. And I think you'll see, and you know, a, and a doctor, your physician, can get that data immediately. Mm. And I think you're gonna see a lot more advances. And I think you'll see a lot of improvement around that over time. Do you think, are we at the point, given the amount of incredibly useful but very sensitive data that can be collected, not just in the healthcare industry, but in every industry about what we're doing? I, you know, I've, I've spoken to folks in insurance that say, you're going to be able to write completely personalized policies if you allow sensors in the home and the car, and you know, that could be great. It could also have unintended consequences. Are we going to need to move to some kind of um, a data bill of rights or, or some kind of more explicit bargain, maybe of the kind that Europe is thinking about right now with the general uh, data privacy regulations that they're coming up with? Do you, what do you see coming down the pike and what are you guys talking about in the boardroom in terms of that? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we're, we, I, I think we, we're going to have to continue to make sure that we're advancing privacy and data. I think that, you know, that's where, um, you know, we're talking about in the boardroom. Mm. Are, are, are we, as we advance to that personal, people are, you know, will demand that their data is protected. And I think we need to continue to make sure that we invest properly and, you know, we drive towards that. I, I you know, I think that, you know, I talked to her when I first started that customers are demanding new things from us. They will continue to demand mm. that privacy is, you know, that we protect their privacy. Mm, mm. I want to, I have a bunch more questions, but um, in the ten, five, ten minutes or so we have left, let me open it up. And I think that there are some mics on either side if folks want to ask a couple questions. And just introduce yourself, please. Hi. My name is Lamia. I have a preventative healthcare startup. So my question is, what, it, what does it take for insurance to start um, shifting dollars from a reactive care to pre preventive care, but not more into uh, like in how can you get carrots reimbursed? How can we how can we get to the food reimbursements? And what does it take in terms of data for insurance to seriously consider that as an option? Yeah, we we are very focused on preventive um, care. We spend a lot of time. I mean, we, because we believe that health starts with preventive care, and you know, do a, a fair amount of reimbursement relative to preventive care. So that's core to our strategy. It's core to what we do every day. Um, because I think if you think about your health, the more you can spend time on the preventive, then we're not spending time on the chronic pieces. And then obviously we're you know, continuing to reimburse on the chronic side as well. Does that mean that a meal can be reimbursed, for example, for someone who has prediabetes? Uh, well, we haven't gone that far yet, but it's something that you know, we should be looking at, and we're looking at kind of our broad um, portfolio and, and sort of re reinventing how we think about benefits. It seems like a natural question as, um, as health gets de-siloed, because that's what you're talking about. It's not just about you know, what, what happens when the doctor draws your blood. It's what kind of day did you have? What stresses are you under at work? What and can, you, can we figure out how to have a personalized health plan, personalized yeah. plan, so that you get to pick and choose what you want for sort of coverage and reimbursement, right. which is very different, because now it's very broad. Yeah. OK, thanks Thank for the you. question. Get one more in. Hi, I'm Ron Stoltz. Um, so I wanted to address the ecosystem question. So I'm an old guy who's about to uh, <laughs> move into old. the debt. Well, I'm pretty old. Uh, <laughs> I, look better. I look younger than I am. Uh, good good health care. <laughs> consume a lot. Yeah, that was my point. And that's <laughs> the question that I have. Uh, so I've been a PPO and an HMO member alternately through my life. But here in Northern California, a large percentage of people are members, they call them members, of the Kaiser Permanente mm. system. Mm. Uh, as, and so my question is, and it was prompted by the 
trial balloon that, that Kaiser floated, that they're going to establish their own medical school. Mm. And that was a shot across the bow as far as fleshing out their mm. ecosystem. So I just wondered if you look at the Kaiser model and do you see it as a side-by-side -side with the PPO insurance model that, you know, part of your industry? And how do you view uh, the Kaiser system vis-a-vis uh, -vis a more private or PPO system? So I, the Ki I, you know, we obviously look at the Kaiser system and it's been a very successful, I look at the Kaiser system as a holistic um, healthcare. And as you think about what we're doing with CVS and where we're advancing our strategy, we're thinking more broadly in, in that regard as well. We're coming at it from the consumer and you know, kind of how consumers want to engage in their health and in their healthcare system. And Kaiser's looking at it from a, um, a delivery system um, perspective. And so they're delivering care and we're looking at it from an access to care. Mm. Do you see them as a threat? Um, I think the whole industry is um, revolutionized. I think that you know, Kaiser has been exceptionally successful in California, um, but we haven't seen sort of them in the broader um, country. But I look at all kind of healthcare as, I think there's opportunities and I think there's threats as well. You know, it's interesting because that raises the point too that um, healthcare is, is relative to any other country uh, quite fragmented in the U.S., quite local, fragmented along state lines, much exactly. more so than, than other countries. Okay, we'll take one last question and then. Hi, my name is Jan D'Alessandro. I have a consulting business. Um, my question for you is that I'm starting to see, you know, one of the major problems that we have in this country in addition to the healthcare crisis is financial crisis, that you know, over 80% of Americans are retiring at or below the poverty level. They're not um, in, encouraged to save. So I'm seeing a lot of companies start to implement financial wellness programs mm. side by side with their health, health and wellness programs. And I'm wondering if you see any opportunities to partner. And if so, I have a client I'd like to discuss with you. <laughs> well, we can certainly discuss uh, Deal making uh, is it, happening. It, exactly right. And, and we do. And we think about it more broadly as part of our uh, overall um, uh, employee, uh, we call it our EAP. We have financial programs and financial wellness. And we also, as part of our social compact, implemented uh, reimbursement for um, college tuition. And so we are spending time, and we believe in that broader. It's that holistic care of health, wellness, financial, and emotional stability, and looking at a person holistically. And that's how we're thinking about it. So OK. Nice I'll email you about Chime Bank. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. OK, so we're, we're basically out of time. But let me just ask you one final quick question to wrap up. Um, I, I have to say, I kind of dread healthcare in America, um, having lived in, in the UK for 12 years where it was just easier. I mean, you obviously have an incredibly bifurcated system. You can get the best cutting edge care here, but there's a big gap in the middle. Is that gap going to go away in the next three to five years with what Buffett and Diamond and you guys are doing? I mean, are we going to have a profoundly different system or is it going to be incremental? I think we're going to make changes. I wouldn't say it, was, it will be huge in the next three to five years. Healthcare will evolve and emerge, and I think you'll see good progress, but, it won't, but I think it'll take us a little bit longer than that to do it. Okay. All right. Well, Karen, thanks Thank for being you. here. Thanks for everyone's questions.